Welcome, everyone. Love, Preet, how are you today? Good to see you. Great to see you too, Matt. Hopefully you're doing okay with the current strike right thing. Well, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, we were just chatting about that offline here before we started. Uh, while we're waiting for a few people to come in here, uh, what is your favorite summer Olympic sport to watch? If you have one, have a little fun poll here oh. to kick things off. Give you guys a few seconds for those of you who are on the call already. How about you, Love Preet? I was going to say, I, if I had to pick one, I would go with soccer. What is, what is yours, Matt? Yeah, I also enjoy watching soccer, but I uh, track and field is probably my favorite to watch. I'm a, I'm a runner myself, and I like watching, especially the distance runners I love. Okay. Yeah. I think there'll be some yeah. world records set, set this year. Was skateboarding on the list here? Uh, yeah, it is. I was looking at that. I'm like, OK, <laughs> that's good. Uh, While well, we're waiting for a couple other people to uh, finish this skateboarding story, I went to a nine-year-old skateboarding party with my daughter a couple years ago and uh, left the skateboarding party with a broken pelvis, elbow, and wrist. <laughs> I, I fell hard at this nine-year-old yeah. birthday party. It was, it was bad. You know, I tried skiing once, and uh, this was my very first time I went to a place, and then my legs split, and I haven't been able to do skiing ever since. So that was painful. <laughs> really, really painful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Learn We've learned our lessons. All right. Most people yeah. have submitted here. Let's see the results. Looks like swimming. Swimming's the winner. Uh, gymnastics yeah. number two. Uh, we'll definitely be watching some gymnastics in my household. I know my daughter's a gymnast. And then uh, basketball, number three. Volleyball, number four, it looks like. Wow, volleyball and soccer tied for number four. I would have never guessed that. And then some folks who don't have a favorite and or don't, aren't going to be watching, which makes sense. All right. Had a couple minutes to settle in here. Welcome, everyone, to our first meeting of our new webinar series, Go for Gold. Achieving Peak Performance with a Healthy IT Environment. Uh, this is a three-part series designed to help you tackle the highest risks in your environment and harden security while increasing your efficiency. A few things while we're, before we dig in too far here. Um, I want to ensure that you've seen our new IT health assessment. You should have received this by email already. Uh, if you haven't, though, right in front of you on your console right now is a link to this IT health assessment. I recommend you pop it open and just leave it open in your browser. Um, it's a brief assessment tool that provides a solid look into the strength of your IT infrastructure. Um, by identifying key areas that need attention, the assessment will serve as a valuable resource for you while also serving as a blueprint for this webinar series. This assessment is built or, or the webinar series is built around this new IT health assessment. So please give it a look when you have some time. Um, also on this slide here, make sure you send us any questions in the Q&A section. There's also a chat section as well. So you can uh, definitely chit chat with us as we go and ask any questions as well. And you'll also be receiving a $10 digital gift card for attending today, coffee on us. So watch your inboxes for that as well. Inspired by this new five-minute IT health assessment, um, we'll be meeting over the next three Wednesdays to dive into some critical areas of IT security and management. Uh, today, we'll light the torch on this discussion by digging into uh, privilege and applications and how to manage uh, privileged access management and apps like a pro. A little bit about Recast to set the stage. We exist to simplify the work of IT teams, to simplify your work, helping you create secure and compliant environments. Our solutions integrate with your existing IT infrastructure, providing quick visualiz visualizations into your endpoints, um, time-saving right-click actions, and third-party app management. You can see this is a little grid of some of our software tools and where they fit within the broader picture on the outside edge here. Today, we're gonna to be digging into a couple of these tools, Privilege Manager being one of them. Privilege Manager helps streamline privileged access management. Uh, we're proud of the ease of use we've built into this product. We know that there are some competitors out there in this privileged access management space that um, 
can take a football team of PhDs to implement the product. Um, Privilege Manager is quite clean and straightforward to use and manage. Um, we'll take a deeper look into this in just a few minutes here with Prajwal. Application Manager is our third-party patching tool, and it excels in ensuring that your applications are always up to date automatically. By automating third-party patch management, you reduce vulnerabilities and save you and your team time. Um, Application Manager covers over 2,500 apps, which is the largest app catalog on the market in the third-party patching space. We also will dig a little deeper into this product in just a minute. Lovepreet is back for today. Uh, Lovepreet is our former sysadmin turned recast product expert. Um, here at Recast, he serves as a solutions engineer. Welcome, Lovepreet. Happy to have you on board here, and I will hand it off to you to take it away. Thank you, Matt. Happy to be here. I'm going to start my screen share, and hopefully we'll have no issues with that. All right. Okay. Matt, let me know when it's uh, showing up on the side, okay? You bet. I can see it. All right, awesome, perfect. Okay, so just like Matt was talking about, we're going to focus on two important uh, conversations today, applications and privileges. We'll talk about how we can help you manage both of them in a, in a clean and automated manner. I think the best place to start would be the application manager, only because this is going to be a little bit, uh, I would say, a, a product that needs a little bit more time to talk about. So I'm going to start with that. And just like Matt was talking about, we have the largest catalog in the market when it comes to third-party patching. So whatever uh, you know, third-party patching solution that you're using today, or maybe you're doing it manually, whatever patch catalog, whatever third-party catalog you have today, I feel very confident when I say that we can match the highest percentage to that. Now, the other great part about the application manager is it's not just a patching solution. If I have to define this from a sysadmin's perspective, I would call this a third-party lifecycle management solution. Pretty fancy definition right there, but there's a reason behind it. And that reason is that this application manager, it's going to integrate with your SCCM or team to not only do patching, but it's also going to automate five steps that we sysadmins take when we build applications inside SCC, for example. And those five steps are usually the creation phase, when we create an application, we you know download EXE or MSI files, and then we build an app, we add attachment logic, add uh, install strings, add icons. It takes a huge, huge amount of time to build one app. And then after that, you, you have to do the same thing again if there's a new version for that application. Here, we're going to automate creation for you. Then we're going to automate deployments for you, so you don't have to do the deployments. We're also going to take care of your update and the patching piece afterwards. Then we will take care of the automatic retirements. So you have new versions active and deployed. What happens to the old ones? Well, we can help you retire them automatically. And then we also go one step further, which is the deletion part. We also take care of the deletion. So we are doing our own digital housekeeping for you. So as far as you as a sysadmin is concerned, this is going to be a set it and forget it solution who's going to be uh, handling everything once you set it up. Let's look at this in action. So if I were to, let's just say, start managing an application, say Google Chrome, type that in right here. It's going to make an API call to recast backend. It's going to grab the latest version of Google Chrome. Now that I have this version here, I can hit deploy. And now it's going to start building a workflow an automation. We call this a deployment process. A deployment process is nothing but a automation which would define the logic and the cadence of that application. Now, we can have multiple applications in one automation, or we can build one automation for every single app, whichever one you would prefer. For the sake of simplicity, I'll just keep one at a time. But if I wanted to, I can pick more. Hit Next. The name of the process, we'll keep it default, next. And now it's able to pull all of your collections from your SCCM into itself. 
If you have this integrated with Intune, it would be able to pull your dynamic or static groups into itself. And then I can pick a collection wherever I want to deploy stuff. So maybe I'll uh, look for my test ring, pick that one, and then I'm going to hit save and close. The moment I do this, it will build that deployment process for me. It will build that automation for me. And then it's going to move this in here, inside the section, deployment processes. I'll go into this. I'm going to go to view details. And these are just the deployment process that I built in the past. Uh, some of them have customization as, as well, uh, some of the automations. But for the sake of simplicity, I'll pick this one. This is something I've already built. Hit view details to that. And in this example, I built a process for Notepad++ and Adobe Reader both. And the moment I built this, the very first thing it's going to do, it's going to go back to SCCM, and it's going to create these applications from scratch. It's automatically going to pull down the EXE or MSI or MSP from the vendor, automatically build the detection logic, the install strings, and whatnot. And then once that application is ready, then from that point on, it's going to deploy it to the cadence that I would specify and the logic and, and the collection that I would specify. So every time my Notepad++ will release a new version or a Ruby reader, it's going to go to my test print collection first, immediately after the release, because these are my test computers. So if, if I want to slow things down, I have the option to do so as well. And then I'm going to add some, have some delay, and then I'll give it to my next collection, which in this example is full deployment range. Now, in my opinion, phase deployment approach is something that has become even more important than it was before. We all know what happened with the CrowdStrike situation. CrowdStrike was set to self-update automatically without you know, uh, admins and inter interference or intervention. But that came out as a disaster, right? The ideal process would have been to disable the CrowdStrike auto-update and then use phase deployment approach or uh, phase deployment um, rings to basically do the update so the whole company wasn't affected. That's what we're doing here. Now, to make this even better, for every one of these collections that we're going to specify, we can do customization on them. So here, I can go to three dots. I can go to manage settings. And now I can specify how do I want my product to go out in the environment for this specific collection. Now, most of these functionalities that you're going to see here, they are not, they're not something new. Like you have seen this before. You have seen this in SEC. But that's the, that's the goal, right? We want to build a product that is simple to use with the minimum learning curve, better UI, automation, and obviously the customization. So here I can specify if the application should become acquired, or it should simply show, show up in the software center so people can download and install it or I can do it with the best of both worlds option, which in essence means that it's gonna check for a superseded version of the application, and if it does detect one, then it will send it up as required. But if it doesn't detect one, then it'll simply make it available. So giving you the capabilities of both of them. And then we can specify how do we want our users to see notifications. I would probably go with none, because the more pop-ups and notifications we show to our end users, the more questions, concerns, and blames sometimes come back to us. So moving on to the advanced section, just like I was saying earlier, uh, same things you're going to see. These are all of the SCCM's customization settings that you all have seen before, that you all love, and we have imported this into our product. So the minimum the learning curve would be very minimum uh, to use this product. Now, if you like these customization settings, great. And if you're expecting more, then we have more as well. I can exit out of this, and now I can go to this cloud view. And now I'm going to get access to even more customization settings. So if in your organization you want to follow a certain naming convention, well, you can specify that right here. That, hey, let's do publisher first, then application, then version, and maybe I still use some x86 computers. So I can put that in here. And then this is the name it's going to take when it shows up in the software center. You can set it once, and then it's going to repeat for every application that you're building. I see there's a question. In the deployment process, example, Microsoft 365, how can we add a configuration XML? That's a great question. We'll talk about this in a second. That's actually the next thing that I was going to show you. 
So here we could do, uh, you know, your naming conventions, but then we could go to advanced section. So there are many functionalities here, but I'm actually going to talk about the question first. So somebody asked that, how do we add uh, additional files or XMLs? There's a way to do this in here. Now, like I was saying earlier, that we will take care of the creation for phase for you. That means we will handle the creation and these tall strings. Every application that is built by us, we will add the silent parameter as well as no restart parameter. So you don't have to look for those. You don't have to spend your time looking for those. But you may have some additional functionalities, like XML file. Well, in that case, we can just put that in here. So let's just say flat configure equal to config.xml. And that config.xml file, we, we will store in the root folder where the application is going to download, which I'll show you in a second. But this is where you can add those additional parameters, whether, to, whether that be an XML file, or if it's a sort of like a, um, you know, like a, like a portal. Or we're talking about CrowdStrike, you need a, to have a license key in that. So you can specify that as well, something like this. Okay. You can have categories. So if you have multiple categories in your environment that you use, we will be able to pull them and see them here. And then you can categorize your software, add instructions or descriptions for your end users. This is going to be very important when I show you SCCM side of things just in a minute. This is basically a folder that we will create for you inside SCCM console. And the purpose of this guy is to keep and host everything built by Recast in a clean and hierarchy fashion. For now, let's just put a pin on this, but I'll show you this in a second. You have multiple BPGs. We will be able to see and pull them in here so you can decide where you want to deploy. We can have super students enabled, multiple options for that as well. And then finally, we could talk about user experience. Maybe we want to quit a specific process you know, before running the installation. So we can specify that process right here. Um, maybe we're going to be able to see right there. Right? And then we could also specify and design if they should automatically force close those executables or if it should be a pop-up to the user asking for this. Okay? And then finally, runtime and estimated install time so the application doesn't take too long, it doesn't get stuck. Now, this is good if you're building like five or six apps. You know? But what if there's an organization who has, let's just say, who has a plan to build about 1,000 apps using our product? Sometimes they can question that, hey, do I have to answer these same questions again and again 500 different times or 1,000 different times? Absolutely not. Because what we're going to do instead is we're going to go to this settings pane, and we're going to pre-stage our settings. So all of those settings that I've been showing you earlier, we can pre-stage them right here. So that means when you build a new application or a new deployment process, it would literally be three clicks. Click, click, and you're done. That's how easy it's going to be. And by the way, if I go to uh, general and advanced section, this is a network path where we're storing all of those files. And here is where we'll paste that config.xml file so you can pick that up and then send it out to, out to the environment. All right, now let's look at the last part, and probably the most important part, which is the SCCM side of things. If I expand the application management, and if I expand the applications, this is the folder that I was talking about earlier, the folder built by Vcast to keep everything in a clean and hierarchy fashion. What is that hierarchy? Well, that hierarchy is publisher, product, and version. So Microsoft's the publisher, product, and then version. And now we can talk about you know, the, uh, the logic a little bit. So just like I was saying in the start that we will handle all of the five steps for you, what does that mean here inside SCCM? That means that the very first time when you build the deployment process, it's going to come here and it's going to build this application for you, whether that be in an MSI format, EXE, or whatever. That's on us. And as you can see, it says created by Recast Application Manager at this time and at this point. So this will be done by us. And if I were to go to deployment types and check properties, you'll notice that detection logic is also built for you. No need to spend time on this. Same thing goes for install strings. And same thing goes for the, uh, the icons and whatnot that shows up inside the software side. 
So all of this done in creation phase. Once we finish with that, then we're going to go ahead and move to deployment phase, in which we're going to go ahead and deploy that application to the collections that you would have specified in the deployment process based on the cadence that you get. Automatic deployment as well. Good. Step number three is the update phase. So now that this 24.07 is active and deployed, three days later, 25 version is released by 7 Same thing is going to happen automatically again. You don't even have to go back any, or to that web portal or even here. We will automatically pull down 25 version. We will create an application and then we will deploy it to the same rings or the same collection where the last version was deployed at. So this way, we make sure to keep your application updated while, we, while also respecting your cadences and your uh, phase deployment approach. Okay, let's move on to step number four. That would be the retirement piece. So now that this 25 version is active and deployed, what's going to happen to this old one, which is 24.07? Well, that is for you to decide. You can either have the retirement or you can either have deletions. That is the cleanup you will configure. Now, if we go with retirements, then what we will do is we'll keep the latest version active and deployed, and one before that will retire that, or like anything before that will keep in a retired state. If you go with deletion option or delete option, then what we will do is we will delete the old versions, not only from this console, but also from your distribution point, and also from that UNC path, the storage space, or the SMB location that I showed you earlier. We're also going to delete your EXEs and MSIs and folders from that point on as well. And now this is important, especially for applications like Google Chrome. Because if we don't clean up that, then it's gonna, you know, it's gonna fill up that space in a month. That's how often Google Chrome updates itself. So that's is also something that's on us. And you have the flexibility to change all of this by going to here and then going to this cogwheel, advanced, and then you can set up what type of cleanup you want to set up. All of this stuff. Now, I know there are some questions on the chat, and I'll take them. Take those questions at the end of the call if we have some time. If not, we can you know, uh, answer those questions via email as well. So that was the application manager product. This is how we help you manage your applications, make sure that they're always updated, especially when we as IT staff members are always so busy you know, with other things. And we, we can't keep up with so many of these programs and so many updates that they're releasing. Some of them once us every other day. So that's the application method. The next one we're gonna talk about is the privilege manager, which is our band solution. Now, on my desktop, I have this setup file, exe file, and I don't have admin privileges to run this. So well, let's see what happens if I try to run. It's asking me for, uh, I don't know if you guys can see the USC prompt or not, but I'm hoping you can. But if you're not able to see it, then this is going, this is actually a USC prompt that's showing up. And it's asking me the admin rights for this. I don't have an admin rights. I don't have any credentials. That's why I can't run it, right? But there's a teeny tiny option called more choices. Then I'm going to go to recast privilege manager. And then I got three options. I will use activation code, run with local account, and run with domain account. These are the three options I can choose from to escalate this process. That's basically how we work. Our goal is that, hey, you have removed admin rights from, from the folks. You know, you're doing your cybersecurity zero trust, which is great, but how, we, how do we do this without sacrificing productivity? Maybe you have some developers who you have removed admin rights from, but now they need some permission, or at least temporarily, to do their work. That's what this is about. So I'll quickly go through all three options. The run with local account basically means that there's going to be a local account managed by our product, which is an admin, and we will use that local account's credentials to escalate the process. Run with domain account would basically mean that, hey, we're not going to use that, that local account, but instead, we will use my own account, the requester's account, Lovepeak.sings account to escalate this process instead. And use activation code basically means that, hey, there's not going to be any self-escalation at all. You need to escalate yourself, you'll have to come to me as an admin. And then I will decide if I'm going to give you the code or not. 
Let's look at local account in action. So just show you how it works. And then I click on local account, select category. These categories that you see, these are all fully customizable by you or your admin. Um, and you can specify what makes sense for your organization. So I'll say application install. I'll say demo app install, for example. Click yes. And voila, I'm able to escalate the process. But if I were to try to run something else, let's just say Notepad, I can't run it. Why? Well, because I only gave justification for VS Code process. That's the only one that's unlocked for me, while everything else is still locked up. This is where our product is different from your uh, Labs solution. Because in Labs, you give the password, and now they have the keys to the whole kingdom. Here, we're not going to give the keys to the whole kingdom. We're going to give them uh, justification-based escalations only for one process. If I want to escalate Notepad, then I'm going to have to give another justification. And this time, just to show you how the other two looks like, so if I go to run with the main account, it's going to pass me the same questions again. And then there's a third step of verification this time, which is my own password. So the first two steps are, does Lovebeat has permission to escalate himself? Yes, he does. Does he have permission to escalate himself on this specific computer? Yes, he does. And third is, does he know his own password? Or that third step will be applied on domain account, but in the local account, there's no password uh, step verification. Now we can look at the activation code method as well, which is just basically a prompt to put in the activation code, which will be granted to the user by the app. There's other, another important advantage to this, and that is that this option is also network independent. That means even if you have no internet, we can still make that activation code work. And if you have an employee sitting in a different country and he's not able to connect to the internet, for example, and you want to you, you want to help him troubleshoot it, well, you can temporarily give him the, the, the permissions even without the internet. Ask him to go to device manager, for example, and then you know do the troubleshoot. The last thing that I'm going to show you is if I go back here to the privilege manager, this is where all of those verifications and configurations are happening. We have a log for everything as well. Who did it, when they did it, why they did it, you have a full log for that. And you can build your group rules and target rules here that which employees are allowed to do the self-escalation, which employees are not allowed to do the self-escalation. And we could also generate codes from here. So if I were to go to this machine, select the validity of the code, you know, select the category, and now I have to give justification because I'm the one giving the code away. So, but put something, and then I have the code which I can share with the user. That is our privilege manager solution, folks. Uh, Matt, I don't think we have any time left for questions, do we? Yeah, I we will answer your questions by email after this webinar. We do have a few great questions, but we will get to them. Uh, with you personally. I think you're right, Lovepreet. Thank you, Lovepreet. Uh, quick question here before we close things out. Are you interested in more information about our privileged access management tool and or our third-party patching solutions? I'll give you a, a minute here to answer this poll question. While I'm doing that, reminder that our IT health assessment is on the screen right now, a link to that. If you've not opened that up or checked that out yet, I highly recommend you do so now. Otherwise, it should be in your inbox as well from an email uh, we've sent prior to this webinar. Just waiting another few seconds here. Let's see, good number of people have submitted. Yeah, thank you all for the the good questions. There are some, some good ones here. All right. Thank you all for attending today. Um, reminder to check your, watch your inboxes for the $10 gift card that'll be landing soon. And 
uh, we have two more webinars in this series uh, next week. Uh, we'll talk about keeping devices secure and up to date. That's July 31st. And then on August 7th, the week after, surfacing actionable data and reporting will be our third webinar in this series. Um, sign up if you haven't already, and we'll look forward to seeing you at those webinars. Thanks for coming today. We'll see you soon.